All right, thank you everyone for joining us on our third installment of our three-part webinar series covering mold flow. Uh, today's topic will be reducing plastic part warpage using mold flow. I'm Scott Bradley with D3 Technologies. I'm an account executive working with our advanced manufacturing solutions. Our presenter today will be Eric Foltz, the senior managing engineer with the Madison Group. And just to take a, a few minutes here to tell you more about D3 Technologies, who we are. We are a platinum partner with Autodesk uh, across the United States. So we're national coverage with over 15 locations serving our customers. Uh, we've been a partner with Autodesk for over 30 years. We focus primarily with our manufacturing customers, focusing on um, manufacturing technologies and the plant solutions. Uh, in addition to all the core technologies, such as AutoCAD, Inventor, Vault, uh, we also specialize in simulation, CAM, PDM, which is our data management solutions, engineering to, engineer to order, PLM, and the Forge platform with Autodesk, as well as the Autodesk cloud solutions. And we, uh, over the last couple of years, have moved into what Autodesk calls the Make Solutions, which includes Moldflow. And we'll touch more on Make here in just a second. So with D3 Technologies, we're able to support our customers, as I mentioned, nationwide. We do that through uh, a number of ways, primarily with our CAD Live solution for training, mentoring for our customers. CAD Live is an option for all virtual instructor-led training where our customers have a classroom environment from their location, we can um, we train on all of our solutions through CAD Live, and uh, offer you know a number of of options as far as technologies to uh, to in improve on that process. We also offer our CAD support and mentoring. So with our CAD technical support, we have a 96% customer approval rating. Uh, and response time, uh, which is best in class leading within the Autodesk partners uh, throughout the United States. And when I mentioned make earlier, uh, this is what I was referencing. So with the Autodesk make portfolio, Autodesk has invested um, a number of resources in, in the billions of dollars over the last five years or so, uh, adding all of these solutions to their portfolio. Everything from generative, generative design, uh, simulation, mold flow, which we'll be talking about today, our advanced manufacturing CAM solution, solutions, such as Feature Cam, Power Mill, uh, and into the NetFab, the additive solutions for 3D printing. So Autodesk has uh, asked D3 to, to step in and help support our customers and Autodesk throughout the United States in all of these solutions. And uh, we're, we're proud to have a partner such as the Madison Group to partner with D3 to focus on power mill, I'm sorry, focus on mold flow uh, for the make solutions. And uh, with that, I'll uh, introduce Eric Foltz again with the Madison Group to start his, uh, his, his presentation today covering the reducing plastic part warpage using mold flow. Eric, are you ready to take control? Yep, I think we're good. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's go here. I think we should be good now. All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for your time. Uh, as Scott stated, this is the last uh, presentation in our first Mold Flow webinar series. First of many though. Um, and so we're gonna be talking about reducing plastic part warpage using mold flow simulation. So uh, a quick agenda, what we're gonna cover today. You know, we're gonna go over a little bit of background and why do plastic parts warp? Um, you know, the variables and the causes of warpage that we need to account for uh, from everything from design all the, through, all the way through processing. Um, also helping you understand how we can predict and improve the warpage uh, that we're seeing in these parts prior to having parts or even if we're in a troubleshooting uh, situation. 
and then also improving our warpage predictions and helping and assuming uh, accurate simulation results so we have high fidelity results. So going back to a similar slide we've seen in uh, previously simula uh, previous presentations, you know, we're, in this presentation we're talking about injection molding and we're talking about injection molding of polymeric materials. While we're focusing on thermoplastics, this would also apply to thermoset materials. Uh, injection molding is a very complex process where we're injecting hot molten material into a colder mold. That material is going to solidify, cool, shrink, you know, develop stresses in this part. The mold's going to open up and then the parts are going to uh, cool down to their final dimensions. And the whole goal of using injection molding, the reason we like injection molding is we can mass produce these very complex parts, uh, but they'll also be dimensionally stable parts. And when we talk about injection molding, that's probably the biggest uh, hurdle that molders and tool makers have to come over is how are you going to produce a part to print um, uh, on those first shots. So that's what we're focusing on today. So what do we need to consider when we're talking about the dimensional stability of a part? So Brandon, on a previous webinar, uh, our part one webinar, talked about what makes a successful part design, talked about wall thickness, that ribbing, the functionality of the part, right? Uh, when we're talking about manufacturing and uh, generating a dimensionally stable part, we're talking about optimizing the material we're using for that, optimizing the part design, optimizing the mold design, and optimizing the overall process so that we're going to get a successful dimensionally stable part. We're going to get the same part on those first 10 shots as we're going to get in the last 10 shots so that we'll have a nice uh, uh, robust processing window. So while we often focus on warpage, and a lot of times when I get involved with a, a customer, um, they're they're say they're interested in well, what's my part going to look like when it comes out of the tool? You know, am I going to have a lot of sidewall bow? Am I going to have problems assembling this component to the other mating uh, components? Uh, what is that? While that's the end goal, we really need to look and see that's the end result. What we got to look at is we got to look at make sure our part design in our DFM process, we've gotten a uniform wall thickness, we've optimized that part design with rib and boss design so that we have, you know, relatively uniform walls, we have the right material selected for the application. You know, then we got to look at mold filling and we got to look at, well, where are we going to place our gate? How are we going to size our gate? Are we generating a unidirectional or uniform filling pattern of this part? And then what are our process parameters we're going to set to help generate this wide processing window? That's kind of what we covered in the part one of our, our series uh, uh, at the beginning of this webinar uh, series. And then when we move on past mold filling, then we got to talk about cooling the part. Are we generating a uniform mold surface temperature? Do we have a good cooling line layout? Do we have the right steel selection in our tool um, uh, so that we can achieve the cycle time that we want uh, for this part? And then, you know, from a warpage perspective, do we have a uniform shrinkage rate on our part? So if you look at these, these individual categories, there may be one word that I, I hopefully have emphasized here uh, when we're talking about each of those stages is the word uniform. So we're trying to generate uniformity in our process so that we're going to get dimensionally stable parts at the end. And also, while we're interested in warpage, we have to build on our building blocks and integrate this into our workflow uh, early on so that we can optimize a part from a DFM standpoint to set us up for a dimensionally stable part in the end on the warpage. So why do I focus on uniformity and why do we say that's a key concept with plastics uh, uh, and polymeric materials? Well, when we look at polymeric materials, we're not talking about metals where we have a nice crystalline, orderly structured block. Um, uh, that has the same structure and, and size and properties um, in, in every unit. Uh, polymeric materials are, uh, they do have a consistent building block, but they really uh, consist of these long chains of these building blocks. 
and we have long chains of different lengths, and that's what we call our molecular weight distribution. And so those long chains are going to respond differently in our molding operation and in, uh, introduce inherent invariability uh, in the material response uh, as compared to, say, maybe a metal, you know, a stainless steel 304, very well-defined material, very narrow spec material. Polymer, polymeric materials, you mentioned ABS, there are many different grades of ABS that we could be talking about that may perform differently both from a manufacturing standpoint and mechanically uh, in the field. So because we're dealing with inherently variable materials, we're trying to eliminate variability in our manufacturing and our design process. So during moldy filling, you know, we're taking these long chains as well, and again, they're varying lengths, and when they're not flowing, they're kind of nice, relaxed position, kind of curled up, they're entangled, that's what gives us our strength uh, of our material, and during uh, injection or mold filling stage, we're going to apply that shear stress or uh, elongation force on these molecules to stretch them out, kind of think of a spring, we're going to stretch that spring out. Um, and, and align them in the direction of flow, not necessarily the state that they want to be in. And then as the material is injected into the cavity, it starts to cool. That material, as it cools from the molten state into a solid state, we're going to shrink. And so that's going to result in a linear change in dimension of our parts. So we're not going to remain at the elongated molten state. We're going to go from a, a larger volume uh, in our molten state to a smaller volume in our solid state, and that's going to cause dimensional issues on our parts. Highly material dependent, highly uh, process uh, dependent. And again, if we're looking at semi-crystalline materials or fiber-filled materials, uh, you know, we're going to have differential shrinkage in the flow or parallel uh, direction uh, of flow, and then we are in the perpendicular or cross-flow direction. You know, we're also going to have more shrinkage in a semi-crystalline material than we are with an amorphous material. And amorphous material, we kind of maintain that uh, spaghetti noodle, um, uh, bowl of spaghetti noodles in the solid state um, as we do in the, in the molten state. But semi-crystalline, we have a much more ordered, higher shrinkage uh, change from the molten state to the solid state. And so when we're molding these parts, ideally the part is going to shrink uniformly in all directions. So if we're molding this part in the molten state, as it cools, it's going to change in every direction the same amount. So we could ideally just apply one uniform shrinkage rate and our parts are going to be to print. However, the nature of injection molding being a pressure-driven process where we have high temperatures, high fill speeds, and high packing pressures, um, we're going to have inherent variability in our pressure and our cooling history in our part. And so with that inherent variability in our pressure, we're going to have variable shrinkage rates from the molding process. So the more we can minimize that variation, the better dimensional stability we're going to have, and the more likely we're going to be able to apply that relatively uniform shrinkage rate to our part and have dimensionally stable parts. And again, because we have variability in our shrinkage rate, what I like to think about is if we have the material in a molten state over here on the left-hand side, and uh, as the part cools, these, this material and each of these elements or each of these divisions in my part uh, are going to want to shrink and pull away from the, the other elements that you see there. So ideally, they'd like to see a little gap in between uh, each of these elements as the materials cools. However, in reality, that doesn't happen. These molecules, these elements have to stay connected to one another, so that develops stress in our part because each of these elements is going to want to shrink at a different rate than the others, and they're not going to be in the same position. So this is going to develop our molded-in stress in our part. Our molecules are going to be stressed. They're not going to be in that position that they want to be. And when our molecules are stressed, we're going to shrink that material we're going to have shrinkage of that uh, material in different uh, locations, different parts. Some areas want, may want to shrink less than other areas, but the end part has to figure out uh, uh, a, a lower energy state. And so the area that wants to stay long right here uh, has to compensate with the area that wants to be short. 
And so then that's going to result in a uniform or consistent width of this part. But this one wants to be longer than this one. So it wants to, it has to buckle up and it'll experience autoplane deflection to achieve that similar length or width across this part. So by using injection molding simulation, we can simulate all these stages of this process proactively and produce strategies for minimizing part warpage and finding root cause of our warpage. So we can model in our gates and look at the filling pattern and see how uniform our filling pattern is generated. We can look at the cooling line layout where we model in our drill lines, our baffles, our bubblers, um, our high conductivity inserts as we highlighted in the previous uh, discussion so we can account for that non-uniform uh, cooling of the part and then in the end we can help uh, look at uh, how that part is going to deform out of the mold and how much deflection or warpage we're going to see in our part and if that is going to be a problem or not a problem. So what are the variables and the causes that we need to keep in, in, in mind when we're designing and, and um, manufacturing these, these plastic parts? And we really have to take another holistic uh, approach. Again, you'll notice a common theme. Today's common theme is uniformity, but overall overarching, uh, we're trying to take a more holistic part, uh, holistic view of plastic part design and manufacturing. And here, when we're considering shrinkage and warpage on our parts, we also need to consider things holistically. We need to consider the material. Do we have an amorphous material that's going to shrink less from the molten state into the solid state? Or do we have a semi-crystalline where we're going to have a large uh, shrinkage change from the molten state to the solid state? What does our part geometry look like? Do we have that thickness variation that we want to avoid where we're going to wind up developing stresses in our part and we're going to shrink at different rates? Where are we placing our gate and how are we filling that cavity so we get unidirectional or uniform orientation of our fibers or our molecules so we get more uniform shrinkage on our part? And then how are we cooling this part? You know, if we have a differential cooling from one side of a part to another side of the part, so we have a hot spot here, a cold spot here, um, what's going to happen is we're going to deflect towards that hot spot because this is going to want to shrink more than this one, but they have to find that happy medium and we're going to get that warpage out of the part. So again, looking at all these factors and how they're interrelated, that's where simulation allows us to look in and have millions of in-mold sensors in our part to help troubleshoot that process. Not necessarily just one that's a post gate or end of fill where we're going to be limited in the information that we have. And so what I want to just do here is I want to take a step back and I just want to do a little bit of a nomenclature establishing for this talk uh, and generally when people are talking about warpage. When we talk about warpage, we're generally talking about out of plane deflections of the part. And when we talk about shrinkage, we're talking about in plane shrinkage or changes in dimensions in our part. So when a part comes out, we're going to have a change in length and a change in width. Uh, and that's what our shrinkage is on our part. However, warpage is how flat is my part going to be after it shrinks that certain amount. So shrinkage is in plane and warpage is out of plane for today's discussion. So when we look at those variables and causes, we can also divide these into buckets and we can talk about the part design like we did in part one. And we can talk about the material that we're looking at. You know, we may be able to have the same geometry on our part, uh, have that optimized for everything, but one material may generate less warpage on our part than another material because of its inherent properties. We can talk about, you know, geometry. If we have thickness variations in our part, we're going to see a larger volumetric uh, shrinkage in these thicker parts that cool uh, slower than we will in the thinner parts. And these thinner parts will shrink less than the thicker parts, and that's what's going to cause our deflection. And then again, we can look at gate locations or how we're going to fill this part and orient our material in our geometry. And just changing our gate location can change the amount of warpage we're going to see in our part. We also have the tooling design once we have the part design, right? And again, you'll notice tooling, part design, 
first thing we talk about is the gating and the runner and how we fill that part. Generating that uniform orientation in our part is going to help us minimize the warpage potential in our part. Also cooling, there's lots of different ways to cool our mold. We could go real simple in our cooling line uh, schematic, but we won't cool the part uniformly. We'll have longer cycle times and less dimensionally stable parts when they get out of the mold. Whereas if we put more emphasis on cooling line layout and making sure we're cooling that part uniformly, we can have a more cost effective part that takes a shorter cycle time and is more dimensionally stable. You know, and also we have to look at ejection uh, in terms of mold design, but we really don't account for that in current uh, commercially available injection molding simulations. Um, but it is something that can be a variable that we need to consider when we're using injection molding simulation. Is how are we ejecting that part? Could we be imparting more stress on the part after once it's being ejected out of the part that causes more deformation? And then the final thing is looking at our process. You know, how fast are we going to fill this part? How are we going to pack it out? How are we going to get that uniform volumetric shrinkage that we're looking for? Um, how are we going to heat and cool this part? Um, so that we get uniform cooling of our part. And is injection molding the right process? You know, we're talking about mold flow, but mold flow can do injection compression uh, uh, molding analysis. It can do straight compression molding analysis. Maybe there's a better system that we could select to manufacture parts to generate this more uniform boundary condition for our uh, part. So those are the variables we need to consider. Um, and we kind of went over a lot of those in part one and part two of our uh, scenario, or, or, of our webinar series. So once we have those optimized and we're considering and we've done our best uh, to achieve those uniform uh, parameters in each of those stages, how are we going to predict and quantify our uh, warpage results? And there we got to look at what are our sources for shrinkage variation. We have shrinkage variation due to differential shrinkage in our part, and we'll go into this uh, in the next several slides. Differential cooling uh, of our part, that's that cavity to core, non-uniform cooling of our part, and then the orientation effects uh, of our part. That's a molecular or fiber or filler uh, orientation uh, uh, in our part. And then also just the natural injection molding process, I kind of break uh, injection molding parts into plates, boxes, and, and cylinders. Um, so a lot of times with injection molding parts, we have something with depth in it and just the natural mold restraint or corner effects is going to cause issues with our part. So when we talk about differential shrinkage, we're talking about really wall thickness variations in our part, part design aspects, or gate location, not being able to produce that uniform volumetric shrinkage in our part that is going to result in non-uniform shrinkage of our part um, from one area to another, and that's going to result in warpage. So when we have differential shrinkage in our parts, we're going to have to start looking at, well, what's our wall thickness distribution? Do we need to change that? What's our gate location? Do we need to change you know, our packing profile? Do we need to change our gate location so that we can pack out those thick areas better than those thin areas? Differential cooling, here we're talking about variation in the cooling rate of our part from the cavity side of the mold to the core side of the mold. If we have one side of the mold hotter than the other side, we're going to cool that hotter side at a slower rate than the colder side, and that's going to result in uh, warpage for our part. So here if we see that differential cooling is our, our factor uh, for, for driving warpage, we start looking at how can I change my cooling line layout or my coolant inlet conditions, my flow rates, my coolant temperatures, my coolant media that I might be using to help uh, uh, produce this part? And then also, do I need to start introducing uh, alloys or high conductivity inserts into my mold to better cool this part or allow for a more uniform cooling profile uh, in my part? And then we also have orientation effects. You know, again, we have these long spaghetti noodles that we're elongating into our part. Um, so based off how we gate our part or and how we're filling that part, um, 
we're going to introduce uh, some orientation of the either molecules or the fibers or the fillers in our part that will result in differential shrinkage. You know, here we're looking at a, a, a housing where we have two gates on this part and we have this, the sprue and the runner system. And what we can look at is we're looking at the fiber orientation in our part and we can see that we're having non-uniform fiber orientation, different colors, um, fiber orientation in different areas of the part. And if we look at the fiber orientation at the bottom of this sidewall compared to the top of the sidewall, we can see that the lines are oriented different. Here we're oriented along the length of that sidewall, whereas at the top we see less orientation, not a red color, uh, and the, the, the lines are directed in different direction. So that means these are going to want to shrink less than these. So that's going to generate a force or a stress in my part, and the part has to compensate for that stress. So it maintains a similar strength or uh, length on that sidewall. And what that results in is I get this sidewall bow in my part because of that non-uniform orientation in my part. So I, start, I have to start looking at my material, my gating, and my filling parameters for this. However, I could easily do another simulation where I just fill this cavity or I fill this uh, mold with, with a single gate. So here we have the two gate scenario. Here we have the single gate scenario. And we go from you know, a very warped part coming out of the mold to a much less warped part, more dimensionally stable part. Because look, now we have more uniform color and more uniform orientation of these fibers or fillers in our part. Uh, along these sidewalls. Again, look at that word, uniform. And again, by looking at this, by inject, using injection mold simulation, we can look at almost every spot in the mold and get data at every spot of that mold. Within mold sensors, we're not going to get any information about orientation. We're not going to be able to look at any other part besides where that sensor is. Um, so that we have to start guessing on what's happening. And then the final factor would be corner effects. You know, with box like geometries, uh, we have a natural concentration um, of heat on the core side. So if this is a box geometry or a right angle geometry, uh, you know, on the cavity side, the heat is escaping from the molten material and it, it's going into a larger cavity. On the core side, uh, the heat on these corners is concentrating into this corner and it has nowhere to dissipate. So it's going from a large area into a smaller area. That's going to run this corner hotter. And when the part gets ejected out of the mold, that's going to create that 90 degree to want to uh, collapse on itself. And that's why we see on box-like geometries, we get these non-uniform wall profiles where we're, we're kind of cupping in in the center and we're wider at the the, the corners. So that's due to corner effects and our geometry of our part. So we would have to focus on how can we change that geometry? Can we add a gusset in here to thin this mass out so that we put less thermal energy in this corner and put less moment to collapse those sidewalls in? You know, and again, that's a lot of data that we just told you you had to consider, right? So by looking at uh, using injection mold simulation, we can look at each of these effects if we have it modeled in uh, properly uh, side by side. So if I just have my, my, uh, my model without a cooling line layout, you know, I'll get a part prediction and I'll see what, how is my part predicted to deflect and warp after it's out of the mold and is that due to that differential cooling or non-uniform cooling of my part. If I don't have uniform, if I don't have my cooling line light model uh, modeled in, uh, then I'm not going to have any influence from differential cooling. And if I don't have, if I have an amorphous material, I'm probably not going to have any orientation effects uh, that's driving my warpage. So everything comes down to differential shrinkage, that gate location, and um, uh, and my part thickness distribution. However, if I start incorporating my cooling lines you know, for these parts. So you can see here these dash lines. Well, that's my cooling lines. Now you can see that my warpage mode has changed and my warpage magnitudes have changed as well. And I can see that now the majority of my warpage is driven by differential cooling and I need to change my 
uh, warpage strategy uh, by addressing it with cooling rather than just through part design changes. You can see that here to here, we're pretty similar across the scenarios, but by accounting for the whole system, we're able to better optimize this warpage troubleshooting uh, scenario. So when we are troubleshooting, we can use simulation to find that root cause, but it is important to model in the whole system, the feed system, the cooling line layout, everything like that. And then we also, uh, you know, we're not just interested in how it's going to warp, but we want to know those numbers. So we can quantify the warpage by looking at a contour plot where we can just kind of let the part freely uh, deform as it would want to um, on this part, and we can scale that so we can better visualize how much bow are we going to have at the open end of this dust pan and how much of this handle is going to come up. You know, we can scale that easily in all directions, or we can choose to only do it in certain directions for our part. However, without having control over what we're looking at, uh, we can also use anchor planes to make sure the part is deforming consistently from one iteration to the other. And so we can do side-by-side -side comparisons where we fix three different points on our part to create a plane and say, is iteration one really uh, better than iteration two, or is iteration two better than uh, iteration one? Uh, so by using anchor planes, we can have better control in how we visually uh, uh, view and size the warpage. And we also don't just have to rely on uh, color contours. It can be a little bit difficult to quantify uh, the warpage on this part by just looking at color contours. We can create XY plots where we actually grab nodes along this edge here and we say well how much are we warping from this side to this side so we can not only say yep that's a that's an area but that red means three and a half millimeters on my part so here's a case study where we used injection molding simulation uh, to help troubleshoot a already existing mold here we had our battery box on our part uh, the toolmaker needed to determine why the end wall of this container was deflecting excessively. Was it because of cooling with these deep cores in here? Was it because of non-uniform wall thickness? Was it because of this ribbing? Um, and you can see that they had quite a bit of warpage of these part end walls coming out of the mold, and we had to be less than a millimeter of warpage to allow for assembly. The material was a telc-filled polypropylene. So we went ahead and we did a simulation of their current process, and you can see we matched their warpage mode pretty well right there, and we wound up matching the magnitude very well. And then we used XY plots. So we basically took uh, a series of points along this edge, and we said, well, how much are we moving in from this point to this point to that point? So we could quantify how much end wall bow we were seeing. And so we did that, and so overall we got a magnitude of our parts, and then we also were able to break that magnitude up in our XY plots by looking at the differential cooling, you know, that non-uniform cooling from the, those deep cores onto the cavity side of the mold. You can see there's really no warpage because of differential cooling. And differential shrinkage, yeah, maybe we'd have non-ideal uh, uh, part thickness distribution on this battery box, but really that's not driving our warpage. Everything is driven by this corner effects, and so we know that we shouldn't waste our time uh, try and troubleshoot this from a processing standpoint, save the material shape, save the man hours, get a solution faster, and let's modify uh, the part geometry and add in some windage into our part, and we can use this data to help drive that, that solution. How much warpage would we integrate into this mold? And so we use this data to help us build in that windage or that anti-warp in our part. Another case study where we're looking at cooling, here you can see we didn't necessarily model in the whole tool system, but we were comparing a conformal cooling analysis or conformal cooling layout where we have uh, an inlet and an outlet here or inlet and an outlet here, and we can have uh, uh, cooling lines up in these deep cores. We're dealing with a glass-filled material, uh, semi-crystal material nylon, and we compared that to a conventional cooling line layout where we didn't get any cooling up into those tall cores. 
And so this is what our cooling line layout looks like with the conformal cooling analysis. This is our mold temperature distribution. And again, look with the conformal cooling, we are cooling this part, maybe not totally uniformly, but much more uniformly uh, with the conformal cooling layout than we are with the conventional. That's going to lead to less uh, warpage on our part. And when we look at the warpage of our part overall in these deep cores, you can see with the conformal cooling analysis, these side walls are much straighter than with the conventional cooling line layout. We got a 17% uh, reduction in our warpage overall for our part. Um, so we had straighter side walls and we were able to maintain a shorter cycle time as well. So a lot of benefits from that. So we're, by modeling this in, we're able to quantify and see the benefits before we even have the tool, before we invest in that conformal cooling technology, we're able to validate uh, its usefulness in this case. But not always, you know, we can't always, uh, you know, solve all the problems up front. You know, sometimes we have to come up with a shrinkage and a warpage compensation uh, men, uh, methodology or, or strategy to troubleshoot uh, dimensional stability issues. You know, and so we can still use simulation to under, help us understand what are shrinkage rates for those critical dimensions. And maybe we can't get a uniform shrinkage, but we can at least get a shrinkage rate for the, our critical dimensions. And we can use mold flow, injection mold, and simulation to get those shrinkage rates of those critical dimensions. Here are blue lines, maybe the width is a critical dimension and the length is a critical dimension. We can at least get those shrinkage rates for our part. And we can also take our, our part, you know, with the mold flow, we can take our part and we can export that warp geometry and we can scale that warp geometry uh, uh, to whatever we want. So we create an anti-warp geometry that we can bring into our CAD package and compare to our assembly and how much of an issue is this going to be uh, when we, we get these parts out of the tool. And then we can also design in an anti-warp geometry for our part so that we can give that to the tool maker, build wind engine to our tool like we did with the battery box, and then have parts warp in to be uh, uniform. So the idea is that, yes, ideally we would be able to mold this, this uh, rectangular channel like this, but we know that those sidewalls are going to cup in, so we would bow those sidewalls out on my part so that when it does deflect, they're going to come in flat, and our end part is going to look like our original part and our desired part overall. So by being able to export this geometry, we're going to be able to better generate an, uh, a tool-ready file um, before we even cut steel. You know, once we get our, our warpage results, we always have to view it with a critical eye, and so we want to say, well, how you know how accurate is my simulation, and you know how confident am I in these re uh, warpage results? You know, and it's critical to have good inputs uh, for our parts uh, to have accurate warpage results. So that means we're using the actual final part geometry uh, that we're simulate, simulating and we're going to mold. We have the complete mold design. We're going to have a cooling line layout. We're going to have the high contributing inserts. We're going to have the feed system um, as the tool is going to be constructed. And then also we're going to have representative process conditions. You know, one of the things that I uh, do a lot when I get involved with my customers is I talk to their process engineer and say, hey, you've seen other parts like this. What are you thinking for general process windows uh, for this part? They don't have to tell me the exact process. That's why we're doing the mold flow. But if I can stay within a window that my process engineer is comfortable with, you know, I'm going to have a much better chance for success. And then also we want to make sure we have good material characterization. We also want to understand our, understand our process sensitivity, and really I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but again, understanding did we optimize our fill, did we optimize our runner and gates, did we optimize our cooling, and did we optimize our packing. If we did all those and we feel that we have a robust process window uh, of these first four steps, then that's going to help us have a more robust, dimensionally stable part uh, when it comes out of the tool. So here we're going to do iterations. We may do a DOE to help us. Uh, troubleshoot these process. So we make sure we're on a nice level playing field. We're not at the apex. We're going to fall off over a little bit of deviation to our process one way or the other. And then we also have to make sure we have very good material characterization data for our actual resin. We want to run these simulations with our actual resin that we're going to mold with. 
and we want to generate shrinkage data um, to be used in mole flow. And that, there we're talking about CRIMS. Maybe you've heard of CRIMS data. Uh, that's a multiple flow specific uh, file. And so what is CRIMS? CRIMS is Corrected Residual In Mold Stress uh, Model, which basically the solver is going to use and it's going to correct our warpage predictions and our shrinkage predictions so we're going to get ac more accurate warpage predictions on our part. When we say if some uh, material is CRIMS characterized, it means that we've molded several actual plaques, physical parts under different molding conditions, and we've measured the shrinkage in the flow or along the length of this tag die and the cross flow or across the width of this part. And then the software is going to do the calculations for us to improve our warpage predictions. So when we have a material that's CRIMS characterized, here we have the blue we have different process settings for molding these tag dies. And on the blue, these are the actual shrinkage results that we get in our part right here. With the green, if we didn't have CRIMS data, you can see we're following the trends very well. So we'll get that shrinkage variation well. We might get good warpage data, but in order to get good shrinkage data, we want that CRIMS. And you can see we just get much better correlation with the CRIMS data in our shrinkage values. So we can choose that shrinkage rate more appropriately for our part. And we do that for the flow direction and our cross flow direction. You can see both the red lines with the CRIMS model match the blue lines much better than the non-CRIMS model. So summarizing it all up, you know, injection molding simulation is a very effective tool in proactive, uh, proactively optimizing part and mold design decisions and also helping us uh, understand the processing issues uh, so we can produce dimensionally stable parts. By using software up front, there is more flexibility in, in what levers and gears we can change uh, to help alter any warpage issues up front, and this ultimately saves time and money for our parts. And in order to achieve good dimensional stability, we need to optimize our mold filling and our cooling, all these steps that we talked about previously in, our, in this webinar series, in order to get good dimensionally stable parts, which again, by using mold flow simulation, we're going to be able to look and really dig deep uh, and get the answers we need so we're going to have success on those first shots. And then the analyst needs to make sure and look at the results critically that they're putting in good inputs and we have enough of the model accounted for so we're going to get good results out of this uh, simulation. So that wraps up our presentation today. You know, I wanted to thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar series. Um, you know, this is the final one of our series. We're going to kick out another series uh, uh, at some point, so we'd love to hear what other topics you'd like to hear about. Um, you can either reach out to myself at the email address shown or Brandon Kingston. He's my counterpart uh, at D3, and uh, we'd love to hear what you're uh, interested in. And if you don't want to wait for our next web webinar series, we do have a blog up um, uh, with just mold flow specific topics. And then we also have virtual tr that virtual training platform where we help you uh, use MoleFlow more specific, both the advisor package and the insight package overall. And you can go to this link to look at all the available training. And it's real nice because you can do it from the comfort of your own desk uh, where you can keep a, a nice safe distance from, from anybody. And then if you're looking for additional resources, you can go on the Madison Group. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, White papers on there talk about how processing affects part performance and your, your overall process. And of course, you can reach out to the D3 team uh, at the information below here. And as Scott highlighted before, they're very responsive and we'd love to talk to you and, and help you figure out how you move forward with your plastic part optimization. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric.